Uh, first question, have anyone heard of the either libraries that I mentioned, Siphon or Pi by 11? Yes, I guess everyone at least heard of Siphon. Er anyone ever written your own C extensions? Okay, it means it's painful, right? <laughs> So first, I will go through. Um, I, I would like to give you guys a, a takeaway. Uh, the first takeaway that uh, writing the C extension is not that painful. Uh, sometimes it's easy. And um, before going into details, I will I will show you guys uh, some little bit details on the tricks on the Python uh, performance enhancement. And then I will. Uh, the main dish today is uh, comparing the Python and Py by eleven. We got to do the, the syntax, the features, all the stuff. Uh, first, uh, a little bit background about myself. I'm now a quantitative developer working in SIM Chorus Limited, so which is a quantitative assets management firm. Uh, the people call it the Quant firm. Um, I'm working closely with the researchers. They call it Cons. <coughs> Excuse me, to generate alpha signals. Uh, alpha is, um, uh, means it's, it's a financial terminology, so it means the excessive returns um, correlated to the market movement. And we also help manage and uh, optimize the portfolio uh, regarding to the portfolio manager's uh, risk control or risk measures and manage the risk. So our objective today, uh, first of all, we I think we, we all agree that uh, performance and stability are both equally important. Uh, we don't want our code to have any bug, but at the same time, uh, especially we release our software, uh, the first question the client asks is whether we can enhance the performance. Um, I would say uh, everyone, everyone in my firm, uh, even the quants, the portfolio manager knows how to code in Python. So it's good that we start everything uh, from Python because the learning curve is flat. And but I guess everyone will agree that performance is always the painful part in Python. But today we are going to focus only on CPU bound problem. So if for example if you're a web developer, then you concern more on the I.O. problems. Maybe that is not your concern to write anything under the C extensions. So I will go through some um, a simple example which is uh, used uh, for the to benchmark the performance uh, for different approaches I've mentioned. Uh, this is a computation which is commonly uh, called uh, in the financial software or. Uh, uh, the process, so it, it's called the com computations of risk exposure. Uh, so each instrument has their own categories, for example, currency, the trading, uh, exchange. So um, I would say it's a, it's a low level API that everyone will call to get the risk exposure of the portfolio regarding to the category. <coughs> for example, I have a portfolio which uh, has uh, four instruments, but they fall into two um, currency. Uh, some may trade, trade uh, under the U.S. exchange. Uh, some may trade in Eurex. Then I would like to get the risk exposure for the risk. Uh, uh, so, for the currency, for example, I would like to get the risk exposure for USD and Europe, and then I know how much I can hedge for Europe dollar currency risk. Then uh, the first method to do it is for loop. It's trivial, it's readable, everyone knows how to write it. Then how can we enhance the performance? Normally we go for Google, Stack Overflow, Stack Overflow. people will give you good answers. And these are the common solutions that people will come up. Uh, and this comprehension uh, is the performance gained for the iteration itself. Uh, NumPy normally is the people's first instinct for computations, uh, for array operations. So NumPy is good that um, uh, under it, the simple operators are all written in, uh, in C API wrappers or the, in the Cypher level. 
so we can take the advantage of what they call the vectorizations to run a list of arrays on the simple operations running parallel for each uh, element in the list. So if you have multiple cores, you can enjoy the um, multi threading underneath, back behind, if you're running the simple operators in NumPy. And also the linear algebra uh, libraries they use, all are numerical library used in all the platforms, uh, all on the multi threading then the people will come up pandas if you have a little bit more complicated operations uh, especially you are data scientists uh, you're doing the data analysis then pandas is the way you go that most of their apis are written in siphon level you can enjoy the c level uh, performance when all your operations are all under the um, uh, siphon api the pandas apis like this but I would say one caveat that you have to be uh, consider is be aware that every operator that pandas produce will create you a copy. So copy is an overhead to your performance. Uh, that's why in this example, I try to prevent the copy. And also the function they use is quite native. I would say read the both regarding to the uh, SQL nice statement. We just group by the label some of the exposure then give the result. So uh, I benchmark with a thousand of instruments and there are 500 labels randomly assigned on the instruments. First compare the for loop and the next comparisons. Uh, if you're surprised that there's no performance gained, just look at the computation of the risk exposure. The magnitude of the runtime is much higher than the performance gain between the for loop and this comparison. So they may have no much difference, especially for our functions to have a, a big runtime. Uh, I would suggest you always use the profiler, even though the native Python uh, standard library profiler can provide you a very good result right <coughs> after the bottleneck. Uh, if you're an advanced user, use uh, PyFresh. Then numpy.podit, uh, for this month, it takes advantage of the vectorization I mentioned, and also the C API code in the numerical libraries. So it has around 50% performance gain. Then it goes for pandas, group byte, so everything all under in the, the siphon level and numpy level, then you can have 30, 25 to 30 percent performance gain out of that. Then you may ask, what else? If I use pandas everywhere, uh, performance is still uh, sucks uh, regarding from the user's perspective. And um, I have do I've I've done a bunch of multiprocessing already. That's what happening in my workspace. What else can we do? Then the people will go to oh, C extensions. Uh, first question, why Python is no? Why we need to write the C extensions? Uh, if you go back to Python 101, Python is an interpreting language. It means it just convert your Python source code to the uh, bytecode, uh, which is an extension of PYC. Then the Python virtual runtime just uh, run the bytecode on the fly. So it comparatively is lower than the C++ or C, the compiled language, or even the just-in-time language, uh, C Sharp or Java. But today we are not going to discuss the uh, just-in-time solution like PyPy or Lumber. Uh, two main reasons. One, uh, changing the Python version from C Python to PyPy sometimes is an infrastructure problem. If you're working in large-scale corporations, you, you need to escalate the infrastructure team. That's not something pressure for everyone. Uh, second is, uh, just in time doesn't guarantee that you always have the performance gain compared to Python and even the um, uh, uh, compound language. So why don't we go for the best one? Then you may ask, uh, why we compare the Cyborg and Py11? There are a bunch of solutions provided in the market already. So I would say Cyborg and Py11, they're in two different worlds. Uh, Cyborg it's a static uh, Python compiler. It means you write everything which is syntax like Python, but you can compile it in the C extensions. Even though you, you have the py files, you change the extension to py compile assist, then you already gain 10 to 20% performance. So there's no pain point for Python developers. Py by 11 is another world. 
It means you have your C or C++ source code. You will need to bind it with the C Python API, which is painful if someone have written the C extensions before. And compared to Boost Python, which is a big gain already, uh, compared to C Python, Python 11 is a header-only file, header-only libraries. It means you don't need to import unnecessary libraries. Then we compare between them. Um, I would say for uh, building or compilations, there's not much difference between them. They support both platforms that commonly used. Uh, you, if you would like to uh, compile in the setup.py, it's pretty easy for Cyvon. Uh, PyBy 11, it will be a little bit more complicated, but uh, they have already provided a good example in their documents, so there's no pain part. Command line, uh, if you would like to compile these uh, single source code to your C extensions, uh, Cyvon just run the Cyvonized. Uh, PyBy 11, you may need to resort to your uh, uh, the compiler in the run in your in your running machine, uh, like GCC or CLAN, but they have also provided a good example of it. I Python metric functions, which is important to me because every day I work on Python Jupyter notebook, and then um, uh, every time I would like to test on a particular function written in Python or PyPy 11, I just put the source code in the cell, compile it, uh, use it in the next cell. So Cyborg and PyPy 11 supports it very well. And, but uh, PyPy 11, you may need to install the external library called IPyPy to do it. Uh, for writing the functions, so for both, um, I would say this support quite well for all the features uh, for writing the Python functions or methods. Uh, Cyborg has their own syntax. If you would like to keep the, your functions in the Python level, just keep the uh, function declarations as dev. Uh, also, you can declare as C dev or CP dev, means you will need to expose the functions only in the C level or in both C and Python level. Uh, big questions for developers whether support well for dot string. Uh, yes, for both. Uh, for Python 11, you just provide it when you buy the function. For function overload, same as Python, Cyphon doesn't support the function overload. PyPy Py Py 11 uh, supports it, means if you have multiple function signature, you can just bind into the same uh, single Python functions. It is pretty cool for me uh, as a background of a C developer. Then, whether it supports the uh, named or unnamed uh, rebel list uh, argument. So for Cyphon only support for the Python native functions, but not the CPDF. Uh, Python 11, yes. Keyword argu arguments are always like to force the users always pass in the named argument list. So yes, uh, sorry, no for, for either way. So I can't force it anymore. Just give you a taste of uh, Cyphon source code. So um, it is declared as CPDF. And uh, you can declare your type, or uh, even though you don't declare, it's fine in CPDEV. And I can, I can declare as a NumPy array and put a dot string just under the function, same as this Python syntax. In the Python level, you can get your uh, function dot string, which is pretty good. PyPy 11, so the upper part it is C or C++ source code. There's nothing related to PyPy 11. So they have multiple function signatures, and then on the lower part, we just buy it via the PyPy 11. So normally the people will put the upper, upper source code into the header files, and the lower part in the CPP files, and then compile on it. So you can see they can have multiple function signature, and then bind to the same function called um, PyPy 11 underscore functions. So PyPy 11 will locate well for which function to use underneath in the C or C++ method and the core the value regarding to that. Also, you can have your dot string. Uh, I would say PyPy 11, uh, you can see there one more dot string they will always de by default to, to provide that, the function signature. Next, the types. I would say uh, PyPy and Cyphon, they both uh, uh, convert well for the C or C++ types natively to C types. For example, the uh, double in 
uh, in the C to um, uh, flow in Python, all those stuff. The mixed type, uh, whether you can declare integer or float uh, in Cypher, it is called fuse types. Uh, but in Python 11, you cannot do that, but you can do it via the function overload I mentioned before. Uh, whether it supports mapping the C++ standard library containers, like mapping the vector in CPP to list in Python, or you just return the unordered um, map in, C in the um, source code, and then it will automatically map it to deck. So yes, for both. Uh, it give you a taste for Cypher source code. So you can see, you can put pointer in the Cypher source code. You can put the list, uh, the array in the Python in the Cypher source code, and then it can bind correctly for the type in Python level. Even though in CPDEV you don't declare any return type and returns the uh, CPP vector, you can return it as a list in the Python level. Then people mostly write um, Python in object-oriented language, so binding class is important, I guess, for everyone. Uh, Python, Python 11 natively support binding C++ code to uh, the Python level. For Cypher, you can write it at, uh, as um, a Python-like syntax, so you just declare cdef before the class keyword. It's, it's called extension types. Or you have your C++ source code, and then bind it into the Cypher. Does it support property, uh, class method, and static method? Uh, yes. Natively for Cypher, you just put your decorator uh, before the, uh, your method. For Python 11, you just declare when you buy it. Operator overloading, that means whether you can overload your class uh, operator like addition, subtraction, square brackets. Yes, for, for both parties. Inheritance. Uh, why we write in object oriented because of inheritance? Of course, it's yes for both. But if you would like to buy the C source code into Cypher, I would say try not to do that because the inheritance is painful. My two cents is impossible. Uh, by default, if you have your, um, uh, your classes binding into Python, you cannot dynamically set your attribute to it. Uh, but if you really want to do that, you just declare it in the both library. Right. Give you an example for Cypher. Uh, there's a class called order. So you can provide a dot string then C def means all these attributes only accessible in the C level, but not on the Python level. Then you have to provide your wrapper property or methods to expose those attributes. Meanwhile, uh, there's a class called stop border override on it. The only difference is uh, there's one more attribute called stop price. Then um, with this inheritance, you can get back your supercast attributes automatically. If you check on the Python level whether um, uh, order is the superclass of stop order, it can return you yes. And you can get the um, uh, method resolution order, the inheritance ordering, it will show you in the Python level. Meanwhile, if you have your header files, the C++ source code for order uh, is the same piece of code uh, in C++ level then you buy it via the PyBy11. So you can natively uh, provide the dot string of the class. Uh, meanwhile, for the stop order, you have to declare your inheritance ordering. Uh, but it will automatically bind the superclass method to the stop order. So you can get back your superclass attribute price. You can get back the stop price. And if you check the inheritance in the Python level, it always return true, true, and the inheritance and dot string, or equivalently same as the Cypher source code. Cypher, the same, if you have the header files, you can import it in the Cypher level. So first, you just import the class, or import the header files, and declare which class and method you would like to import. Then you have to wrap your class Find the Python class to contains the pointer of the CPP class. And also you have to expose the attributes by uh, the Python method or Python attributes. But after that, it will be the same. Meanwhile, as I mentioned, try not to do the inheritance here. It's painful. 
access to Python to module an object. So even though you write everything on C extensions, that sometimes you're asking whether I can not import the uh, NumPy object or NumPy function back and call some Python attributes underneath. Uh, yes, natively for Siphon, as I mentioned, if you just compile your .py to .pyx and then uh, run it, it's the same behavior. But for um, I, I, uh, sorry, PyBy11, it would be a little bit more complicated. The same piece of code, if I would like to compute the L2 long for the vector, so if you look at the PyBy11 first, you have to import the NumPy. Then you have to get the attribute uh, which is for the module or the Python object. After that, after computation, you just get back the Python object. You have to cast it back in the double to return it out. So if your source code have a bunch of dependency on the uh, Python libraries, for example, NumPy, uh, consider well whether you move to PyPy F. Return value policy. Uh, this is the only thing that happens in PyPy 11. I would say if you write everything in Cyphon, they manage very well for the reference counts, for the memory allocations, all those stuff. But if you buy your stuff via the PyPy 11s, it means you have to consider well for the return value policy. Um, for example, in this case, uh, I have a class uh, called data. It contains a string. Then the, pond, uh, the container will contain the pointer of data, and then there's a method to expose the data out. Uh, same as before, I just buy uh, both class and uh, by the method uh, get data. So first time, I just get the data pointer out, and then print out the value of the data. It's working fine. But by default, if you don't declare the return value policy in PyPy11, it means you just give your ownership to Python. Uh, when Python finds there's no one referencing that object, they clean the uh, data or the, the, uh, the object. So the second time, you will need to get back the pointer. The data has been cleaned already. So you will have memory corruption. That's the lucky case. Sometimes you got this segmentation fraud, which don't give you any trace back. So if you would like to retain the ownership, so you have to declare the return value policy explicitly. So for example, you just declare the reference, it means the ownership will be retained in the C++ level. Then it means you have to maintain your lifetime of the object in C++ correctly. Otherwise, there will be memory leak or when you're running 24 hours for the same process, you will find that the memory accumulates with the free. The smart way is you can do it by the smart pointers. That's why it's called PyPy11. It's a possible variable for this CPP11. So if you just return the shared pointer, but not the native pointer of the object, then the reference can will be hold underneath in the shared pointer. It means if either way, the C level and the, um, and the Python level, no one is referencing the object, in the share pointer will create, will create the uh, memory. They will do it automatically by shared memory already. Finally, benchmark. I would say before going to benchmark, uh, most of the time, both libraries uh, can compile the C extensions and give you a very stunning performance gain compared to Python method. And I would say in general, uh, most of the time, Python 11 give you a little bit better performance, but that's, the, that's not the main point. The main point is how much we can, we can gain compared to Python level. So I write the examples what I mentioned for the ex compute exposures uh, into the Cypher and the PyPy11 and compare the, um, the performance. So if you compare the Cypher and the Pandas group by the best one in, uh, in the Python level, it already gives you four or five times performance gained. Pi by 11 is done in this result, but just only this particular example. If you consider some other ex examples, the performance gains is roughly the same. So for you guys, the takeaway is if you really want to write these extensions, it's easy, but consider about uh, what, how you should do it. Uh, for example, you have a big um, a source code base on Python, then migrating them into the Cypher is pretty easy, straightforward. You don't need to migrate everything. And for me, it's 80-20 rule. So you just migrate 20% of your source code to Cypher. 
the no level API. It already gives you a stunning result. However, if you have the CLCPP source code, uh, especially your third party libraries doesn't provide the Python API, Python source code, which is rare today, I would say. But if it happens, uh, I try to use uh, PyPy11 to buy to, to the Python level, uh, but not the side font. Uh, finally, it really depends on your team's expertise, resources. Same as you write everything in CPP, it will cost you three or four times more in the development process than the Python. So it really depends, I would say. Future prospect. Uh, if we look forward, then I would say the trend is moving, moving toward the PyPy11. One of the example is TensorFlow is now migrating their Spring to PyPy11 so that everything goes to there. Uh, PyArrow, someone has suggested to the, to the author that please use PyPy11 to use Siphon, but they're still considering it. Keep an eye on my PyC. So if you are a big fan of typing, my PyC is used to um, uh, check this uh, static typing. My PyC is used to compile my Py but still not exposed uh, for stable uh, development to use. But I would say, keep an eye of it. If it really happens to be in a good shape, it means if you write everything in your Python code, declaring, declaring the type that can help you to compile the C extensions, which is a big gain compared to a Cypher. You need to write in Cypher. Uh, I would recommend you to read the uh, Dropbox um, uh, uh, the, one of the posts in the blog, which is called Our Generative Type Checking for me nice of Python. It gives you a very good history how the MyPy and MyPyC happens in Dropbox. Finally, if you are considering the acceleration via GPU, uh, please have a look on the uh, Rappers Cube DVF, uh, which is a stunning result to use the Pandas API, but move it on the computations in the GPU perspective. Uh, last but not least, I would like to thank you for the uh, uh, PyCon community, which is a really great, great work for this uh, event. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send me emails, or um, uh, after the uh, presentation, I will upload the materials to my GitHub account. Thank you.